Section 14 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John Nicolay and John G. Hay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Stephen L. Moss, StephenLMoss.com. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John Nicolay and John G. Hay. Section 14. Campaign for Congress. In the months that remained of his term, after the election of his successor, President Tyler pursued with much vigor his purpose of accomplishing the annexation of Texas, regarding it as the measure which was specially to illustrate his administration and to preserve it from oblivion. The state of affairs, when Congress came together in December 1844, was propitious to the project. Dr. Anson Jones had been elected as President of Texas. The Republic was in a more thriving condition than ever before. Its population was rapidly increasing under the stimulus of its probable change of flag. Its budget presented a less unwholesome balance. Its relations with Mexico, while they were no more friendly, had ceased to excite alarm. The Tyler government, having been baffled in the spring by the rejection of the treaty for annexation which they had submitted to the Senate, chose to proceed this winter in a different way. Early in the season a joint resolution providing for annexation was introduced in the House of Representatives which after considerable discussion and attempted amendment by the anti-slavery members, passed the House by a majority of twenty-two votes. In the Senate it encountered more opposition, as might have been expected in a chamber which had overwhelmingly rejected the same scheme only a few months before. It was at last amended by inserting a section called the Walker Amendment, providing that the President, if it were in his judgment advisable, should proceed by way of negotiation, instead of submitting the resolutions as an overture on the part of the United States to Texas. This amendment eased the conscience of a few shy supporters of the administration, who had committed themselves very strongly against the scheme, and saved them from the shame of open tergiversation. The President, however, treated this subterfuge with the contempt which it deserved, by utterly disregarding the Walker Amendment, and by dispatching a messenger to Texas to bring about the annexation on the basis of the resolutions, the moment he had signed them, when only a few hours of his official existence remained. The measures initiated by Tyler were, of course, carried out by Polk. The work was pushed forward with equal zeal at Washington and at Austin. A convention of Texans was called for the 4th of July to consider the American propositions. They were promptly accepted and ratified, and in the last days of 1845 Texas was formally admitted into the Union as a state. Besides the general objections which the anti-slavery men of the North had to the project itself, there was something especially offensive to them in the pretense of fairness and compromise held out by the resolutions committing the government to annexation. The third section provided that four new states might hereafter be formed out of the territory of Texas, that such states as were formed out of the portion lying south of 36 degrees 30 minutes, the Missouri Compromise Line, might be admitted with or without slavery, as the people might desire and that slavery should be prohibited in such states as might be formed out of the portion lying north of that line. The opponents of slavery regarded this provision, with good reason, as derisive. Slavery already existed in the entire territory by the act of the early settlers from the south who had brought their slaves with them, and the state of Texas had no valid claim to an inch of ground north of the line of 36 degrees 30 minutes, nor anywhere near it, so that this clause, if it had any force whatever, would have authorized the establishment of slavery in a portion of New Mexico, where it did not exist, and where it had been expressly prohibited by the Mexican law. Another serious objection was that the resolutions were taken as committing the United States to the adoption and maintenance of the Rio Grande del Norte as the western boundary of Texas. 
All mention of this was avoided in the instrument, and it was expressly stated that the state was to be formed, quote, subject to the adjustment by this government of all questions of boundary that may arise with other governments, unquote. But the moment the resolutions were passed, the government assumed, as a matter beyond dispute, that all of the territory east of the Rio Grande was the rightful property of Texas, to be defended by the military power of the United States. Even if Mexico had been inclined to submit to the annexation of Texas, it was nevertheless certain that the occupation of the left bank of the Rio Grande, without an attempt at an understanding, would bring about a collision. The country lying between the Nueces and the Rio Grande was then entirely uninhabited, and was thought uninhabitable, though subsequent years have shown the fallacy of that belief. The occupation of the country extended no farther than the Nueces, and the Mexican farmers cultivated their corn and cotton in peace in the fertile fields opposite Matamoras. It is true that Texas claimed the eastern bank of the Rio Grande from its source to its mouth and while the Texans held Santa Ana prisoner under duress of arms and the stronger pressure of his own conscience, which assured him that he deserved death as a murderer, quote, he solemnly sanctioned, acknowledged, and ratified, unquote, their independence with whatever boundaries they chose to claim. But the Bustamante administration lost no time in repudiating this treaty, and at once renewed the war, which had been carried on in a fitful way ever since. But leaving out of view this special subject of admitted dispute, the Mexican government had warned our own in sufficiently formal terms that annexation could not be peacefully effected. When A. P. Upshur first began his negotiations with Texas, the Mexican Minister of Foreign Affairs, at his earliest rumors of what was afoot, addressed a note to Waddy Thompson, our minister in Mexico, referring to the reported intention of Texas to seek admission to the Union, and formally protesting against it as, quote, an aggression unprecedented in the annals of the world, end quote, and adding, quote, if it be indispensable for the Mexican nation to seek security for its rights at the expense of the disasters of war, it will call upon God and rely on its own efforts for the defense of its just cause, end quote. A little while later, General Almonte renewed this notification at Washington, saying in so many words that the annexation of Texas would terminate his mission, and that Mexico would declare war as soon as it received intimation of such an act. In June 1845, Mr. Donelson, in charge of the American legation in Mexico, assured the Secretary of State that war was inevitable, though he adopted the fiction of Mr. Calhoun that it was the result of the abolitionist intrigues of Great Britain, which he credited with the intention, quote, of depriving both Texas and the United States of all claim to the country between the Nueces and the Rio Grande, end quote. No one, therefore, doubted that war would follow, and it soon came. General Zachary Taylor had been sent during the summer to Corpus Christi, where a considerable portion of the small army of the United States was placed under his command. It was generally understood to be the desire of the administration that hostilities should begin without orders, by a species of spontaneous combustion, but the coolness and prudence of General Taylor made futile any such hopes, if they were entertained and it required a positive order to induce him, in March 1846, to advance towards the Rio Grande and to cross the disputed territory. He arrived at a point opposite Matamoras on the 28th of March, and immediately fortified himself, disregarding the summons of the Mexican commander, who warned him that such an action would be considered as a declaration of war. In May, General Arista crossed the river and attacked General Taylor on the field of Palo Alto, where Taylor won the first of that remarkable series of victories, embracing Resaca de la Palma, Monterey, and Buena Vista, all gained over superior forces of the enemy, which made the American commander for the brief day that was left him the idol alike of soldiers and voters. After Baker's election in 1844, 
It was generally taken as a matter of course in the district that Lincoln was to be the next candidate of the Whig Party for Congress. It was charged at the time, and some recent writers have repeated the charge, that there was a bargain made in 1840 between Hardin, Baker, Lincoln, and Logan to succeed each other in the order named. This sort of fiction is the commonest known to American politics. Something like it is told, and more or less believed, in half the districts in the country at every election. It arises naturally from the fact that there are always more candidates than places, that any one who is a candidate twice is felt to be defrauding his neighbors, and that all candidates are too ready to assure their constituents that they only want one term, and too ready to forget these assurances when their terms are ending. There is not only no evidence of any such bargain among the men we have mentioned, but there is the clearest proof of the contrary. Two or more of them were candidates for the nomination at every election from the time when Stuart retired until the Whigs lost the district. At the same time, it is not to be denied that there was a tacit understanding among the Whigs of the district that whoever should, at each election, gain the honor of representing the one Whig constituency in the state, should hold himself satisfied with the privilege and not be a candidate for re-election. The retiring member was not always convinced of the propriety of this arrangement. In the early part of January 1846, Hardin was the only one whose name was mentioned in opposition to Lincoln. He was reasonably sure of his own county, and he tried to induce Lincoln to consent to an arrangement that all candidates should confine themselves to their own counties in the canvas. But Lincoln, who was very strong in the outlying counties of the district, declined the proposition, alleging, as a reason for refusing, that Hardin was so much better known than he, by reason of his service in Congress, that such a stipulation would give him a great advantage. There was fully as much courtesy as candor in this plea, and Lincoln's entire letter was extremely politic and civil. "'I have always been in the habit,' he says, of acceding to almost any proposal that a friend would make, and I am truly sorry that I cannot to this. A month later, Hardin saw that his candidacy was useless, and he published a card withdrawing from the contest, which was printed and commended in the kindest terms by papers friendly to Lincoln, and the two men remained on terms of cordial friendship. It is not to be said that Lincoln relied entirely upon his own merits and the sentiment of the constituents to procure him this nomination. Like other politicians of the time, he used all proper means to attain his object. A package of letters, written during the preliminary canvass, which have recently come into our hands, show how intelligent and how straightforward he was in the ways of politics. He had no fear of Baker. All his efforts were directed to making so strong a show of force as to warn Hardin off the field. He countenanced no attack upon his competitor. He approved a movement not entirely disinterested, looking to his nomination for governor. He kept up an extensive correspondence with the captains of tens throughout the district. He suggested and revised the utterances of country editors. He kept his friends aware of his wishes as to conventions and delegates. He was never overconfident. So late as the middle of January, he did not share the belief of his supporters that he was to be nominated without a contest. Hardin, he wrote, is a man of desperate energy and perseverance, and one that never backs out, and, I fear, to think otherwise is to be deceived. I would rejoice to be spared the labor of a contest, but being in, I shall go it thoroughly. His knowledge of the district was curiously minute, though he underestimated his own popularity. He wrote, As to my being able to make a break in the lower counties, I can possibly get Cass, but I do not think I will. Morgan and Scott are beyond my reach. Menard is safe to me. Mason, neck and neck. Logan is mine. To make the matter sure, your entire senatorial district must be secured. Of this I suppose Tazewell is safe, and I have much done in both the other counties. In Woodford I have Davenport, Sims, Willard, Bracon, Perry, Travis, Dr. Hazard and the Clarks, and some others, all specially committed. 
At Lakin, in Marshall, the very most active friend I have in the district, if I accept yourself, is at work. Through him I have procured the names and written to three or four of the most active Whigs in each precinct of the county. Still, I wish you all in Tazewell to keep your eyes continually on Woodford and Marshall. Let no opportunity of making a mark escape. When they shall be safe, all will be safe, I think. His constitutional caution suggests those final words. He did not relax his vigilance for a moment until after Hardin withdrew. He warned his correspondents day by day of every move on the board, advised his supporters at every point, and kept every wire in perfect working order. The convention was held at Petersburg on the 1st of May. Judge Logan placed the name of Lincoln before it, and he was nominated unanimously. The Springfield Journal, giving the news the week after, said, This nomination was of course anticipated, there being no other candidate in the field. Mr. Lincoln, we all know, is a good Whig, a good man, an able speaker, and richly deserves, as he enjoys, the confidence of the Whigs of this district and of the state. The Democrats gave Mr. Lincoln a singular competitor, the famous Methodist preacher, Peter Cartwright. It was not the first time they had met in the field of politics. When Lincoln ran for the legislature on his return from the Black Hawk War in 1832, one of the successful candidates of that year was this indefatigable circuit rider. He was now over sixty years of age, in the height of his popularity, and in all respects an adversary not to be despised. His career as a preacher began at the beginning of the century and continued for seventy years. He was the son of one of the pioneers of the West, and grew up in the rudest regions of the borderland between Tennessee and Kentucky. He represents himself, with the usual inverted pride of a class leader, as having been a wild, vicious youth. But the catalogue of his crimes embraces nothing less venial than card-playing, horse-racing, and dancing, and it is hard to see what different amusements could have been found in southern Kentucky in 1801. This course of dissipation did not continue long, as he was, quote, converted and united with the Ebenezer Methodist Episcopal Church, end quote, in June of that year, when only sixteen years old, and immediately developed such zeal and power in exhortation that less than a year later he was licensed, quote, to exercise his gifts as an exhorter so long as his practice is agreeable to the gospel, end quote. He became a deacon at twenty-one, an elder at twenty-three, a presiding elder at twenty-seven, and from that time his life is the history of his church in the West for sixty years. He died in 1872, eighty-seven years of age, having baptized twelve thousand persons and preached fifteen thousand sermons. He was, and will always remain, the type of the backwoods preacher. Even in his lifetime the simple story of his life became so overgrown with a network of fable that there is little resemblance between the simple, courageous, prejudiced itinerant of his autobiography and the fighting, brawling, half-civilized, Protestant friar tuck of barroom newspaper legend. It is true that he did not always discard the weapons of the flesh in his combats with the ungodly, and he felt more than once compelled to leave the pulpit to do carnal execution upon the disturbers of the peace of the sanctuary. But two or three incidents of this sort in three-quarters of a century do not turn a parson into a pugilist. He was a fluent, self-confident speaker who, after the habit of his time, addressed his discourses more to the emotions than to the reason of his hearers. His system of future rewards and punishments was of the most simple and concrete character, and formed the staple of his sermons. He had no patience with the refinements and reticences of modern theology, and in his later years observed with scorn and sorrow the progress of education and scholarly training in his own communion. After listening one day to a prayer from a young minister which shone more by its correctness than its unction, he could not refrain from saying, Brother, three prayers like that would freeze hell over. 
a consummation which did not commend itself to him as desirable. He often visited the cities of the Atlantic coast, but saw little in them to admire. His chief pleasure on his return was to sit in a circle of his friends and pour out the files of his sarcasm upon all the refinements of life that he had witnessed in New York or Philadelphia, which he believed, or affected to believe, were tenanted by a species of beings altogether inferior to the manhood that filled the cabins of Kentucky and Illinois. An apocryphal story of one of these visits was often told of him, which pleased him so that he never contradicted it that becoming bewildered in the vastness of a new york hotel he procured a hatchet and in pioneer fashion blazed his way along the mahogany staircases and painted corridors from the office to his room with all his eccentricities he was a devout man conscientious and brave he lived in domestic peace and honor all his days and dying he and his wife whom he had married almost in childhood left a posterity of one hundred and twenty-nine direct descendants to mourn them. Footnote. The impressive manner of Mrs. Cartwright's death, who survived her husband a few years, is remembered in the churches of Sangamon County. She was attending a religious meeting at Bethel Chapel, a mile from her house. She was called upon to give her testimony, which she did with much feeling, concluding with the words, The past three weeks have been the happiest of all my life. I am waiting for the chariot. When the meeting broke up, she did not rise with the rest. The minister solemnly said, The chariot has arrived. From Early Settlers of Sangamon County by John Carroll Power End footnote. With all his devotion to the cause of his church, Peter Cartwright was an ardent Jackson politician with probably a larger acquaintance throughout the district than any other man in it, and with a personal following which, beginning with his own children and grandchildren and extending through every precinct, made it no holiday task to defeat him in a popular contest. But Lincoln and his friends went energetically into the canvas, and before it closed he was able to foresee a certain victory. An incident is related to show how accurately Lincoln could calculate political results in advance, a faculty which remained with him all his life. A friend who was a Democrat had come to him early in the canvass, and had told him he wanted to see him elected, but did not like to vote against his party. Still, he would vote for him if the contest was to be so close that every vote was needed. A short time before the election Lincoln said to him, I have got the preacher, and I don't want your vote. The election was held in August, and the Whig candidate's majority was very large, 1,511 in the district, where Clay's majority had been only 914, and where Taylor's two years later, with all the glamour of victory about him, was ten less. Lincoln's majority in Sangamon County was 690 which, in view of the standing of his competitor, was the most remarkable proof which could be given of his personal popularity. Footnote. Stewart's majority over May in 1836 in Sangamon County was 543. Stewart's majority over Douglas in 1838 in Sangamon County was 295. Stewart's majority over Ralston in 1840 in Sangamon County was 575. Hardin's majority over McDougal in 1843 in Sangamon County was 504. Baker's majority over Calhoun in 1844 in Sangamon County was 373. Lincoln's majority over Cartwright in 1846 in Sangamon County was 690. Logan's majority over Harris in 1848 in Sangamon County was 263. Yates's majority over Harris in 1850 in Sangamon County was 336. End footnote. It was the highest majority ever given to any candidate in the county during the entire period of Whig ascendancy until Yates's triumphant campaign of 1852. This large vote was all the more noteworthy because the Whigs were this year upon the unpopular side. 
The annexation of Texas was generally approved throughout the West, and those who opposed it were regarded as rather lacking in patriotism, even before actual hostilities began. But when General Taylor and General Ampudia confronted each other with hostile guns across the Rio Grande, and still more after the brilliant feat of arms by which the Americans opened the war on the plain of Palo Alto, it required a good deal of moral courage on the part of the candidates and voters alike to continue their attitude of disapproval of the policy of the government, at the same time that they were shouting paeans over the exploits of our soldiers. They were assisted, it is true, by the fact that the leading Whigs of the state volunteered with the utmost alacrity and promptitude in the military service. On the 11th of May, Congress authorized the raising of 50,000 volunteers, and as soon as the intelligence reached Illinois, the daring and restless spirit of Hardin leaped forward to the fate which was awaiting him, and he instantly issued a call to his brigade of militia, in which he said, The general has already enrolled himself as the first volunteer from Illinois under the requisition. He is going whenever ordered. Who will go with him? He confidently expects to be accompanied by many of his brigade. The quota assigned to Illinois was three regiments. These were quickly raised. Footnote. The colonels were Hardin, Bissell, and Foreman. End footnote. And an additional regiment offered by Baker was then accepted. The sons of the prominent Whigs enlisted as private soldiers. David Logan was a sergeant in Baker's regiment. A public meeting was held in Springfield on the 29th of May, at which Mr. Lincoln delivered what was considered a thrilling and effective speech on the condition of affairs, and the duty of citizens to stand by the flag of the nation until an honorable peace was secured. It was thought probable, and would have been altogether fitting, that either Colonel Hardin, Colonel Baker, or Colonel Bissell, all of them men of intelligence and distinction, should be appointed general of the Illinois Brigade, but the Polk administration was not inclined to waste so important a place upon men who might thereafter have views of their own in public affairs. The coveted appointment was given to a man already loaded to a grotesque degree with political employment, Mr. Lincoln's old adversary, James Shields. He had left the position of Auditor of State to assume a seat on the bench, Retiring from this, he had just been appointed commissioner of the general land office. He had no military experience, and so far as then known, no capacity for the service, but his fervid partisanship commended him to Mr. Polk as a safe servant, and he received the commission to the surprise and derision of the state. His bravery in action and his honorable wounds at Cerro Gordo and Chapultepec saved him from contempt and made his political fortune. He had received the recommendation of the Illinois Democrats in Congress, and it is altogether probable that he owed his appointment in great measure to the influence of Douglas, who desired to have as few Democratic statesmen as possible in Springfield that winter. A senator was to be elected, and Shields had acquired such a habit of taking all the offices that fell vacant that it was only prudent to remove him as far as convenient from such a temptation. The election was held in December, and Douglas was promoted from the House of Representatives to that seat in the Senate which he held with such ability and distinction for the rest of his life. The session of 1846-7 to opened with the Sangamon District of Illinois unrepresented in Congress. Baker had gone with his regiment to Mexico. It did not have the good fortune to participate in any of the earlier actions of the campaign, and his fiery spirit chafed in the enforced idleness of camp and garrison. He seized an occasion which was offered to him to go to Washington as bearer of dispatches, and while there he made one of those sudden and dramatic appearances in the capital which were so much in harmony with his tastes and his character. He went to his place on the floor, and there delivered a bright, interesting speech in his most attractive vein, calling attention to the needs of the army, disavowing on the part of the Whigs any responsibility for the war or its conduct, and adroitly claiming for them a full share of the credit for its prosecution. 
He began by thanking the house for its kindness in allowing him the floor, protesting at the same time that he had done nothing to deserve such courtesy. I could wish, he said, that it had been the fortune of the gallant Davis, footnote, Jefferson Davis, who was with the army in Mexico, and footnote, to now stand where I do, and to receive from gentlemen on all sides the congratulations so justly due to him, and to listen to the praises of his brave compeers. For myself, I have unfortunately been left far in the rear of the war, and if now I venture to say a word in behalf of those who have endured the severest hardships of the struggle, whether in the blood-stained streets of Monterey, or yet in a sterner form on the banks of the Rio Grande, I beg you to believe that while I feel this a most pleasant duty, it is in other respects a duty full of pain, for I stand here, after six months' service as a volunteer, having seen no actual warfare in the field. Yet even this disadvantage he turned with great dexterity to his service. He reproached Congress for its apathy and inaction in not providing for the wants of the army by reinforcements and supplies. He flattered the troops in the field, and paid a touching tribute to those who had died of disease and exposure, without ever enjoying the sight of a battlefield, and, rising to lyric enthusiasm, he repeated a poem of his own, which he had written in camp to the memory of the dead of the Fourth Illinois. Footnote. We give a copy of these lines, not on account of their intrinsic merit, but as illustrating the versatility of the lawyer, orator, and soldier who wrote them. Where rolls the rushing Rio Grande, how peacefully they sleep, far from their native land, far from the friends who weep. No rolling drums disturb their rest beneath the sandy sod, the mold lies heavy on each breast, the spirit is with God. They heard their country's call and came to battle for the right, each bosom filled with martial flame and kindling for the fight. Light was their measured footsteps when they moved to seek the foe. Alas, that hearts so fiery then should soon be cold and low. End footnote. He could not refrain from giving his own party all the credit which could be claimed for it, and it is not difficult to imagine how exasperating it must have been to the majority to hear so calm an assumption of the superior patriotism on the part of the opposition as the following, quote, As a Whig I still occupy a place on this floor, nor do I think it worth while to reply to such a charge as that the Whigs are not friends of their country because many of them doubt the justice or expediency of the present war. Surely there was all the more evidence of the patriotism of the man who, doubting the expediency and even the entire justice of the war, nevertheless supported it, because it was the war of his country. In the one it might be mere enthusiasm and an impetuous temperament. In the other it was true patriotism, a sense of duty. Homer represents Hector as strongly doubting the expediency of the war against Greece. He gave his advice against it. He had no sympathy with Paris, whom he bitterly reproached, much less with Helen. Yet when the war came, and the Grecian forces were marshaled on the plain, and their crooked keels were seen cutting the sands of the Trojan coast, Hector was a flaming fire. His beaming helmet was seen in the thickest of the fight. They did not die in eager strife upon a well-fought field nor from the red wound poured their life where cowering foemen yield. Death's ghastly shade was slowly cast upon each manly brow, but calm and fearless to the last they sleep securely now. Yet shall a grateful country give her honors to their name. In kindred hearts their memory live, and history guard their fame. Not unremembered do they sleep upon a foreign strand. Though near their graves thy wild waves sweep, O rushing Rio Grande. 
There are in the American army many who have the spirit of Hector, who strongly doubt the propriety of the war, and especially the manner of its commencement, who yet are ready to pour out their hearts best blood like water, and their lives with it, on a foreign shore, in defense of the American flag and American glory. End quote. Immediately after making this speech, Baker increased the favorable impression created by it by resigning his seat in Congress and hurrying as fast as steam could carry him to New Orleans to embark there for Mexico. He had heard of the advance of Santa Ana upon Saltillo, and did not wish to lose any opportunity of fighting which might fall in the way of his regiment. He arrived to find his troops transferred to the Department of General Scott, and although he missed Buena Vista, he took part in the capture of Vera Cruz, and greatly distinguished himself at Cerro Gordo. When Shields was wounded, Baker took command of his brigade, and by a gallant charge on the Mexican guns gained possession of the Jalapa Road, an act by which a great portion of the fruits of that victory were harvested. His resignation left a vacancy in Congress, and a contest, characteristic of the politics of the time, at once sprang up over it. The rational course would have been to elect Lincoln, but, with his usual overstrained delicacy, he declined to run, thinking it fair to give other aspirants a chance for the term of two months. The Whigs nominated a respectable man named Brown, but a short while before the election John Henry, a member of the State Senate, announced himself as a candidate and appealed for votes on the sole ground that he was a poor man and wanted the place for the mileage. Brown, either recognizing the force of this plea, or smitten with a sudden disgust for a service in which such pleas were possible, withdrew from the canvas, and Henry got his election and his mileage. End of section 14. Read by Stephen L. Moss. Stephen L. Moss.com.